Uh, Mr. Barr has over 30 years of public and private company experience in the mining, technology and real estate industries uh, with a focus on acquisition, finance and development of projects on an international scale. Uh, as a CEO, he has guided his management teams to complete over 300 uh, option joint venture agreements with major, mid-tier and junior companies. Uh, Mr. Barr has raised over $250 million to advance their projects throughout nine countries. Uh, Harry had the idea to get into uh, medical marijuana with Next Gen Metals and to found Green Rush Financial Conferences so that we can start bringing uh, education to the sector. So ladies and gentlemen, please. Yeah, you got to go to the top. Sorry. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Harry Barr. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Howard. Howard did an excellent job helping us put this conference together. In fact, everybody who worked for us did. I'm a little screwed up because we're going to start at the top of that slideshow, guys. That looks like you're way down. Just go up with that slideshow. Yeah. No. Go. Go up with that slideshow. You had Next Gen on a while ago when I left. That's the end of my slide. Just keep going up. Okay, well, when I left here, we had Next Gen on there. It is the Next Gen slides. That is a separate one. No problem. Just to take this coat off, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to go to work here. So I'll just start making it up so we're not late here. Everybody hear me? Okay, well welcome. We're gonna talk about NextGen. That is a public company that is one of our four companies because we've been in the mining business for many years. We've done very well at it. It's been a very tough time in the mining industry for the last three years, we're on our fourth. So we decided, now you go, you got it guys. We decided to take NextGen into a different space. We decided to look at that space starting last August, and then we decided to make, or go to our directors, get approval, list on a new exchange in January, and on the 26th of February, we made our first announcement. Next slide, please. Disclaimer, next slide. Share structure. This company only has about 18 million shares out. When we made the announcement about the 26th day of February, within three weeks we went 7,100% we went up. Do you get that at the bank anywhere? No bank I've seen. And it was unusual because we traded about 50 million shares to get there and we wondered how could you do that when you only had 17.7 million shares out? Management didn't sell out, we owned 42%. But our shareholders were kind of waiting around for something to happen. And some of them moved out and then we ended up with 5,000 shareholders. We only had 500. What's wrong with that story? Next slide, please. So our vision. This is now the public company who owns this conference company is to be a leading provider of venture capital for three industries. Medical marijuana, industrial hemp, which my grandfather grew on a farm we've had since 1866. Okay, And Reuben Stone, you'll see one of our people on the board, he's growing 2,600 acres this year. 300 of his own, he contracts 2,000 more. That's in Ontario. That's impressive. He's 30 years old. Then we decided to invest in a basket of companies. So we're looking at, we're not growing anything ourselves. We're looking at investing in many companies in this industry that provide services. So the first thing we did is bought 100% of a company called Green Rush Financial Conferences. We had about $1,000 to buy that. We're profitable, we're sold out here. First deal. We announced that on the 20th of March. This, today, is the seventh. My lucky day. I like seven. Okay, the other thing we just announced, if you'll get a chance to check, is Green Rush, financial, no, Green Rush Analytical Laboratories. This country needs labs. As a mining guy, I've written checks, I figured it out the other day, somewhere in the 60 to $70 million range to analytical labs. So why couldn't we have one? That's our announcement yesterday. So there's a trend. We got a 100% owned company called Green Rush Financial Conferences, and now we've started a 100% owned company called Green Rush Analytical Labs. And we're going to build some labs out, and we're going to build them in places that need laboratories. Next slide, please. 
I'd like to spend a lot of time here, guys. We started a little bit late, and the last guy that should be late is me. So just look at our management team. Look at some of the people that are going to speak. Two of them are going to speak today. We've got Alan Schofer, who's a, a doctor, all the way from Maui. He's going to talk. Um, let me see, I just so I don't screw this up. We've got our good friend John Burfalo, who's going to be up, I think, next. And we've got a really good management team, guys. I just can't spend enough time on them. Next slide, please. U.S. legislation and Canadian legislation change this industry. And someday when we go recreational, it's going to change big time in this country again. Next slide. One, one point I'd like to make is dormant projects that couldn't get financed a year or two ago are getting financed now. And by the way, this is the venture capital city of the world. Anybody know that? There are more junior companies, mostly mining, than any place in the world. And it is the venture capital city. I had a German friend who helped me for 20 years raise money in Germany, and he used to say, this is a bad Swiss-German accent, but he used to say, Harry, if there was no Vancouver Stock Exchange, somebody would have to invent one. Right? We got it right here. Next slide, please. Now, when Sanjay Gupta changed his mind about this, because I've been watching CNN for a long, long time, I said, wow. Then December 2nd, I just happened to be working from my Maui office, People feel sorry for poor Harry the victim, but he works about 20 hours a day over there. Sanjay Gupta's story played day and night for three months. On and off I'd go. I went to Maui three times, and it played every night at 10 o'clock. So I got to watch it four or five or 16 times. And I liked what Sanjay was saying, because he said, at first I kind of went around with the rules. I went with what they said. Then he said, I came to the realization that it's irresponsible to provide the best, that if I don't provide the best care, I'm going to screw this up, we can as me a medical community. And then he looked at marijuana and he said, you know what, it has its use here. So when Sanjay said he was in, I was already in, but it kind of strengthened my belief. Next slide, please. So what are we talking about here? Every time, which was this morning at uh, 6.30, I was on CBC, we're national, we're in the papers, we're everywhere. It's a very topical subject we're talking about. But everyone wants to say it's medical marijuana you're involved in, right, Harry? Are you growing it? No, I'm not. We're not, okay? But look at all the things that you can do if you do grow it. I should have had this. Look at, and there's a list, guys, and ladies and gentlemen, a whole lot bigger than this. I'm very excited about this because my grandfather grew hemp on a farm we've had since 1866. I was just back in a small community called Renfrew, Ontario, last Saturday night, and my brother had 300 people to a birthday party. He was 50. Anybody ever had 300 people to your birthday party? That was his second one. He did because we live on the bar line, and we've been there since 1866, the same farms. His kids are fifth generation. My grandfather, Harry Barr, grew hemp for the War Act. My dad used to say, now, son, and he'd always point to a field, like the Field of Dreams, and there was something else in it, my dad would say, I hope you're not smoking that stuff. And he'd point over there, and I'd go, what stuff, Dad? The stuff your grandfather used to grow here. He said, it didn't have any of that crazy stuff that makes you young guys crazy. It was called hemp. I said, really? So then I went to the University of Guelph. I studied it. In this same building, in 1999, I came to watch the biggest hemp convention in Canada. And I almost switched then. And because of my agricultural University of Guelph, I followed all the way through. Okay? I like this business. This is the one that turns me on. This is a very good business, too. This business here, we're going to have someone talk about. This business, I use almost every one of these people. For four months, I've worked 20 hours a day. Seems crazy. But because of this, without any chemicals, because of acupuncture, because of massage therapy, the right herbs from China, I get to run 20-hour shifts. Kind of crazy, but it's natural. These guys, you'll hear, can't get financed the way they'd like to. This business will do somewhere around 300 billion next year in the United States. It'll do a trillion dollars around the world because China started and Asia started, and they've been doing it for 4,000 years. Do you think they're wrong? Talk to some people about this business. I want to finance some of that stuff too. Next slide, please. How's my time here, guys? Uh, so it's a new dawn. We're going to have let other people talk about this, but there are new laws April 1st changed everything in this country. And there's a couple of people that, that want to fight that law. They'll be here speaking today. And I'd 
<clears throat> I think around 4 o'clock, excuse me. About 4 o'clock this afternoon, we have a great debate, and it's going to be a whole lot of fun. Might be 4.30. Later on, we're going to have a party in here. It's called Party with a Purpose, because $2 of every ticket that you paid for is going to something to this community. I'll tell you about it later. You've got to come to Party with a Purpose to find out. Next one, please. Okay, so it's a multi-billion dollar green rush. There are a lot of stats out there. I think we all know, if anyone knows what happens in BC in terms of billions, it ain't 2.4, it's billions and billions, right? We don't even know how many. Okay, next slide, please. So here's our investment strategy, calmly. We're gonna grow a couple companies in-house that we have 100% of. The conference company shouldn't ever have to dilute itself because our shareholders of NextGen should own 100% of that. But this is a little conference, guys, ladies. We made money on the first one. If the local exchange would let more companies come here because they are afraid to even mention they're going to change their business, I expect we would have had 50 to 100 more companies here and we would have made a lot more money for our shareholders. But people were afraid to come. A little afraid of the stigma, but more afraid of saying that we have a different business because these are mining people. There are thousands of good mining companies now who would like to look at something different. If you don't find them here, go talk to some. And in a few months, they can change their business plan. They told us it would be about a year to change ours, so I phoned a nice exchange. They're here, the Canadian Securities Exchange. And I said, how long to get over there, guys? They said, three weeks, I'll be there, after I tried to talk to people here. And we did that in January. We moved in three weeks, end of January. 26th day of February, we put our first announcement out. 20th day of March, we said we're going into the conference business. 5th day of May, we said we're going into the analytical laboratory business. And we're not done yet. Next slide, please. Okay, you've heard the Green Rush story. <clears throat> please come to Toronto. If you can find anyone else to help us there, we want to sell that conference out too. This one sold out. And we delayed it a little bit longer. We made it the 26th day, I think it's Thursday, the day before the long weekend. And uh, please get some people to come and see us there too. Next slide, please. So this is what this company does. We just announced it here on the 5th. I don't know if the girls like this or not, but I always like something that I can say. We got a gal. This is my new gal right here. What's wrong with this girl? She's a little green, but she's all right. We've got a vision. We want to be a leading laboratory company in a country that needs 40 or 50, and we only got three or four. Okay? We want to work with the new laws and the laws that will change very quickly. And there's a big emphasis on quality control and quality assurances. Do we understand that in the mining industry? After BREAX and that debacle, the government changed everything here, and we are under some of the tightest laws in mining in the world for assaying. We understand this business. This is not a stretch for me to go around the world and talk to the gnomes of Zurich, the people in Paris and London and Monte Carlo and Germany that finance us, to say, hey, why can't we be a laboratory company? And by the way, what's wrong with our conference company? Next slide, please. So everybody knows where they are. There is a party with a purpose later. There's some unbelievable speakers. Please get out and visit every one of these booths out here. These ladies and gentlemen out there are very intelligent. We had them last night, over 40 people to dinner. It's a very nice crowd of people. They know what they're doing. We have some of the best in the industry. And next year, it's going to grow and grow and grow. There'll be more companies from this exchange crossover. They'll come from mining and they'll come into this industry. And these people know capital markets like I do. They know how to raise money. They know this business. They're public company people who can help people who need money. Okay? That's what we do. So I think that's about it. How's my timing? You introduced John then? Yeah. It's, it's ready to go? Yeah. Okay. Just go down one. I just want to tease him with one here. John's coming up. Is there any? Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Some great speakers. Keep going. Keep going. Last one here, guys. Take a look at the company. I won't summarize. Keep going. I can't help myself. One more. One more. One more. Okay. Now we've taken people to Maui. Anyone been to Maui? When I land, I always say, there's a man from Maui right there. I always say, 
My favorite day of the year is when I land in Maui, and my saddest is when I got to leave. I landed there first, I've been to the Hawaiian Islands many times before, about 1992. I didn't have any money, I borrowed five grand and I bought a condo. Now I have three or four places there. This is the farm that I have, we have, as a family. It looks that way to the ocean, I've had a picture, it looks the other way, and it's organic. Next slide, please. And we want to finance a couple things here. We want to build an alternative medicine center, the only one that Maui would ever have. There's some of the outbuildings I have. There's a big house there, an apartment, two apartments here. There's a fiveplex apartment, there's a big horse barn. All of this is under cultivation from a company right across the street called Maui Herbs. And we want a wellness center here. Look at the, look at the footprint we already have. It would be the only one of its kind in that country, and people would pay big money to come and stay with us. They would eat organic food that is right here. They would be treated by a gentleman like Alan coming up here, Alan Schofer, and it wouldn't be a bad place to go. Next slide. That's the outbuildings. Let's go one second more. One more, please. Okay, this is another little project I have. I didn't want to say Maui, but it is in Maui. It's one of the largest tracts of land in the whole area because my vision is that industrial hemp will grow in the islands and it will change the economy there because now they're doing a lot of work for their older products, pineapples. Unfortunately, they're on their way out. They're pretty much gone. The farm we're looking at is partly pineapples. And more importantly, the other thing that's on its way out is sugarcane. They're subsidizing it up to 50% now. What if we grew industrial hemp here? When Obama or one of the presidents soon says, it's time to grow it. Got a couple plans here. Anybody wants to talk about this? Either one of them, love to talk about it. Now we're going to introduce Mr. John Burfalo. Mr. Burfalo and I met not long ago. He's from a valley, the Fraser Valley. I'm from the Ottawa Valley. We're both valley boys. And there's an old line in the valley. You can take the boy from the valley, but you can't take the valley from the boy. This gentleman has a very, very interesting story to tell. And he's very good at what he does, and he's dedicated his life after a bad fall to this industry. John Burfalo. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Green Rush Financial Conference. It's nice to see you all here bright and early, something Harry likes. He likes to be up right at the crack of dawn. Normally get a few emails around 5.30, followed by a telephone call. He's so excited about this Green Rush Conference and this Green Rush that's happening right now. My name is John Perfello, and I'm NextGen's medical advisor. I'm also a CEO of a company called Medtainer Canada. I have a booth over here, booth 27. If you'd like to know more about it, please come by and take a look. I'm currently working on becoming the staple product for standardized cannabis dispensing here in Canada with licensed producers. Right now, I'm currently working as a legal medical cannabis educator slash advocate. It's my back to work program with WorkSafe BC. Everybody knows the Workman's Compensation Board. So, uh, I mean, it's quite a good title. I fought for that title, and uh, over years, they accepted me as my job title and what I do. I work at a company called Pacific Northwest Garden Supplies here in Surrey, also Green Planet Nutrients. And there, since 2009, I've been educating, basically, customers who were patients that were coming in, teaching them about strain Pacifics for different conditions, learning about their growing techniques, and basically really helping them understand cannabis as a medicine. And of course, back in the days, we had 30 pages of paperwork to fill out, so uh, I was also involved in helping a lot of the patients fill out their paperwork and advise doctors. Before that, I volunteered at a local Compassionate Club Society from 2006 until 2009, called the Green Cross Society of BC. I was the president's right-hand man. I helped set up the education. I worked with the members reps. I helped write a lot of stuff where everybody knows about the four pillar projects with Don McPherson back in the days. We worked with Van Du and a few other companies, organizations I should say, on harm reduction and how cannabis was helping so many people. Different strains for different pains. I started working with Dr. Paul Hornby, who's in the audience right now, and he has an analytical lab, so I was really starting to learn how brownies and cookies and 
converted forms of THC decarboxylated were helping myself so much. So kind of ask why I volunteer for the last three years or why I'm really involved in this business. It really came a reality to me back in 2005. I was at work, woke up bright and early one morning, and I slipped and I fell. And I fell 28 feet and I suffered multiple injuries. I have a video here I'd like you guys to watch so you can better understand who I am, what I'm about. So um, for no further ado, please uh, watch my story. Some stuff on the scissor lift when I first got on there and I tripped backwards on it. And that's basically the last thing I remember and I woke up in the hospital with all my family around me a couple days later. His family didn't think he was going to survive. He just shattered his body, his skull was fractured, his neck was broken in four places. He'd smashed his arm, wrist, hip, ankle, basically everything on his left side had been destroyed. When I stepped backwards and I fell, so either I fell and I hit my head on the scissor lift when I fell backwards, fracturing my skull, knocking myself out, and then free falling 20, 20 feet onto my left side. Dr. Mark Matishak at Royal Columbian Hospital put him back together again. It was a long and painful process. John says it took him a long time to come to terms with the full extent and the severity of his injuries. He says he was numb to what had really happened to him because he was loaded with drugs designed to kill the pain. But I thought everything was fine because I was taking so much pharma. And when I woke up, the pain was excruciating. They gave me a bunch of drugs and I was like, oh, things are great, woohoo, I can be able to do this, right? I started chasing pain. They give you your painkillers, you push your button. The last three, four hours, all of a sudden it's getting worse. And you push that button again real quick. In order for me to function, I needed the drugs in order to move. John left the hospital gobbling down 32 pills a day, drugs that were costing a fortune, $1,400 a month. I was a walking zombie and my friends around me, I lost a lot of friends because I wasn't that person. I started reading what was wrong with me, what these drugs were doing to me, how I can start leading a better quality of life. Then, one day he paid a visit to the BC Compassion Club where he tried medical marijuana as a form of pain management. He was amazed with the results. I started reading more and more about how this was helping me and slowly started weaning myself off of pharma and taking amino acids, natural supplements, converted forms of THC, have creams for my knees when they were getting really bad. And over time, I just stopped using the pharma. My psychologist and everybody around me said, wow, night and day. Today, John sees his doctor once a year to renew his medical marijuana license, which costs him about $500 a year a license that has allowed him to kick the pharmaceutical habit. In acute stages of pain, I don't think cannabis could help me with that excruciating pain that I was in. Pharma was needed. But when dealing with lifelong care with traumatic pain or injury, pharma is not something you use for your whole life. Now I'm, I'm balanced. Wow, that's what a lot of people say to me once they really have seen my video and hear my story. What really happened to me? A lot of people don't understand the extent of my injuries and uh, most have never known I was hurt so bad. I walk around perfectly normal, I feel pretty good. I'm able to control my pain. The reason why people don't really know is because I don't use pharmaceutical drugs. I use cannabis-based medicines. I use natural forms of THC with amino acids to help me with my pain controls every day. Alternative medicines, the way of the future. It's all about the cannabinoids. THC, Delta Tetrahydrocannabinol, CBN, cannabidiol, cannabinol, sorry, CBD, cannabidiol. It's the most abundant cannabinoids in the, in the cannabis plant. This is what's changing the world right now. Everybody's talking about CBD. Yep, CBD, cannabidiol. And right now, it's gonna be the newest medicine. It's gonna be the biggest industry that we're looking at. Everybody's talking about it. Sanjay Gupta, he's doubling down on cannabis-based medicines. Like Harry said, he kept seeing that video over and over for the last three months, so everybody knows exactly what we're talking about. And it really came to after a young girl 
She was four years old, her name was Charlotte. And cannabis was saving her life. Just like a girl here in Vancouver named Haley. Both girls were very young. Haley was 14, Charlotte was four. Both suffered from severe epilepsy and seizure disorder. And cannabis was saving their lives. Not the pharmaceuticals. And like Charlotte's mom said, the medicine didn't stop her from seizing. But the medicine, the drugs, the pharmaceutical drugs, did chop Charlotte's heart a few times. So after Charlotte was having up to 300 plus seizures a week, they figured she wasn't going to make it, so they tried cannabis for the first time. And wow, it changed everything. They went and met a, na a man named Josh Stanley. And I'm pretty sure everybody's heard about the Stanley brothers now because they've created a CBD strain. It's 0.05% uh, THC and 17% CBD. Now that strain, that strain saving Charlotte's life. So hence they call that strain Charlotte's Web. Pretty cool, a CBD strain that's saving a young girl's life. I mean, we're all about children, right? So it's important. Now Haley, at the age of 14, when she was diagnosed and said she wouldn't make it to the age of 16, is now 20 years old. And she has a strain called Haley's Comet. It's another high CBD strain that is saving her life. Haley's able to grow her own medicine, just like myself. And I helped Haley get her license back in 2008 when I was volunteering at the Green Cross Society and working with Dr. Paul Hormy. Haley and people like myself are able to grow their own medicine here in Canada. We have a legal system. It's called the MMAR, and we've had it since 2001, the Medical Marijuana Access Regulations. You can either buy from Health Canada or you can grow your own. Well, there's a new legal system upon us right now, and it's got a lot of patients scared, a lot of people are worried. I'm excited because I'm seeing standardized medicine being able to probably come around the corner. So what's really happening with this industry is, well, I have another video I'd like you guys to watch, and uh, it'll tell you what's, well, what's going on. Please have a look. My name is John Lofello. I grow medicinal cannabis for my pain control. I have a medical gardener. Well, this here is uh, a room that I uh, put a lot of pride into. And uh, when I bought my house, I built my research facility for uh, able to grow my medicine because of my injuries, uh, something that will never go away. I live in a chronic pain. And back in 2005, I suffered uh, an injury at work. I fell 28 feet onto concrete and discovered converted forms of THC and using cannabis for pain control, eating it, and then working with different doctors and, and scientists, they were came up with strains that worked for me and I grow my own medicine. Right now, people have the right to grow marijuana for medicinal purposes. And the government wants to take that right away from them. The federal court has said before the federal government can move in and cut down their plants, there needs to be a trial and the legal issues explored and the court rule on whether those people do have that right or whether the federal government can in fact say, no, uh, you cannot personally grow marijuana in Canada for your own medicine, you must buy it from one of the companies that we have licensed to produce it. Did it upset me when they said they had to destroy it and put it out in Katie Well, I was seeing up all kinds of stuff. I was going to extract. They said I had to destroy all my plant matter, so I was going to extract all the trichomes, get all the real medicine. You get rid of this. There. You want to come inspect it? I'll give it to you. But I'm going to take my medicine out of it first. So Health Canada has admitted that they don't support medical marijuana, they don't want to provide access, they don't want to let people grow it or use it in any way whatsoever, but they're being forced to do it by the courts. And I think that with the years ahead, we're going to continue to see Health Canada and the Harper government and the police try to keep every marijuana plant illegal, 
but because of the changing tides south of the border and everywhere really, I think it's only a matter of time before they back off on this, let patients grow their own, let regular people grow their own in a safe way, and also let people buy it from a commercial provider safely to the mail or in storefront. So the, um, the freezer itself is the cage, which is one of the layers of security around something like this, and which, which is what gives us our, our level 10 security. It's a typical standard bank type vault. Um, in this vault, we can store, according to our security level, which is about 15,000 15, kilos of finished product. Um, after, finish, after it goes through the entire production and QA and packaging process, this is where all of the finished products in, in, in the bottles, containers that will eventually go to patients and will be stored. That, I think, is one of the biggest benefits of the program is delivering that to people so they don't have to worry anymore about, about this, um, uh, you know, this kind of not knowing which one to consider. I mean, you go in and you buy um, anything, any product in the store, uh, you're buying anything in the modern in the modern context, you're going to know that that is something that is been produced and it's been distributed and it's been created according to standards. You know, the Food Safety Act or whatever acts are, are in place now, the only thing that hasn't been is cannabis. So, and you can't do that until you legitimize it. And that's, that's I think, the big exciting thing about the NPR is the, is the ability to do that and to actually bring it into the mainstream and make it a product that uh, can be bought just like anything else. So that means the patients who have had a favorite strain of marijuana um, that they have been growing themselves, they can give that to a company that will then produce that marijuana strain for them. So it's going to be very interesting to see how, how complex the market becomes, how many strains are offered, and how many companies ultimately are registered and regulated. There's more than a dozen already, so we're really going to see a real burgeoning of that, that market. Well, as you can hear and see in this video, there's a new legal cannabis industry here in Canada. There's new rules in regards to medical marijuana. We have licensed producers. Access has been granted for patients that require medical cannabis. And what's happening is Health Canada has gotten out of the business is what they're saying. There's no more calls to be made. You can't get a hold of them. Health Canada has no more involvement. And it's simply now a diagnosis from your doctor, a prescription, going to the Health Canada website, downloading a form from one of one of several licensed producers that offer cannabis flower. There's no more filling out the 30 forms, sending it into the Health Canada, waiting three to six months. Some of us waited up to a year. I mean, it was like a lottery ticket. You had to wait to see if you were going to get accepted or you were going to get right to legal access cannabis. So there's no more doctors charging three to $500 for prescriptions. It's basically sending that form to one of your LPs and basically overnight, you're going to have access to legal cannabis medicine, but only flowers. And in the US, we have legal cannabis. We all know that, Colorado, Washington. But how many people knew that there was over 16 medical states in the United States too? So, I mean, it's only a matter of time. The next generation is cannabis. It's the next gold, people, and it's why we're all here today. We don't have to mine it from the ground. We have to grow it from the earth. We all see the difference, right? Gold. It's something we wear as a commitment, as a ring. A lot of people have it. Or around their neck for love. But basically, throughout history, it's been worth so much. But what is its real value? It's up to just to look at. Right? But cannabis? It has more value than any other mineral or plant on this earth. It's a fuel. It's a fiber. It's a food. Hey, it's a medicine. And that medicine, we're just scratching the surface, really. We have no idea how things are going to happen in the future. The future is cannabis. The future is now. And it is a billion-dollar industry that we're upon us here today. We're all here to learn this industry about its potentials. And everybody's talking about the green currency, the green rush. 
I'll be here all day, guys. Come and see me at the Medtainer booth. I'll also be over at NextGen's booth. And I hope you really enjoy today's education on cannabis, industrial hemp, what we have to offer. And while you're all here today is to understand and learn this new industry, the billion dollar industry, but like Harry said, it's actually a trillion dollar industry and it's only just beginning. We have a lovely lady coming up here next, Dr. Joy Davies. And um, she's been leading the platform here and the provincial and doing a lot of work with local uh, municipalities and doing a lot of education to what is happening with the system and how people are able to use cannabis as a medicine. So it's uh, really nice to actually uh, welcome Ms. Joy Davies here. Thank you very much, everybody, and I hope to see you again soon. Time to switch glasses. Today, I'll be speaking about the six million sick and dying Canadians who are being harmed and abused by our federal government regulations. Good morning, I am Joy Davies. I'm the founding member of the Canadian Medical Cannabis Partners, and I am the government relations director. The Canadian Medical Cannabis Partners is a patient-driven, non-profit organization that has been lobbying our provincial governments across Canada to step up to the plate and bring dignity back to those who have health issues. We are currently represented in BC, Alberta, Manitoba, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Prince Edward Island, Newfoundland, Labrador, and the Northwest Territories. All of our representatives are federally licensed medical cannabis partners with severe to mild health issues that have stopped them from being able to have a, a life, if not for cannabis. I am also a federally licensed medical cannabis partner patient. I live with fibromyalgia. Uh, catalyst was a car accident in 1997. I was five years in bed on 13 pharmaceuticals when friends brought me a, jo a, a bag of joints and said, Joy, this isn't fun. This is medicine. We don't want you to die. And we see that happening in front of our eyes. Please try this. And I did. And I have a life. And I'm so grateful for this plant that I knew nothing about until they brought it to me. Slide, please. Children with up to 200 epileptic seizures a day are benefited from cannabis oil. Seniors with glaucoma who are currently getting needles filled with pharmaceuticals and stuck in their eyeballs to reduce the pressure are denied the right to try cannabis to reduce the pressure and slow down the journey to blindness and possibly prevent it if, it's, if they catch it early enough. Cancer patients are denied their right to medical plant that has been legal for medicinal purposes in Canada for 14 years. Many endure torturous side effects of toxic pharmaceuticals that do not address either their symptoms nor do they cure them of their cancer. No pharmaceutical can cure cancer. Slide, please. The government system we've lived with for the past 14 years has given no opportunity for doctors to be educated in the protocols of administering medical cannabis, even though the doctors have complained at large of their lack of knowledge. They are not being heard. The two largest stakeholders with regard to medical cannabis are doctors and patients, and these are the two groups that have not been consulted seriously by any level of government. Patients who are law-abiding citizens are criminalized by our federal government in Canada. Patients who have to work within a very broken system and at times have to choose between losing their freedoms and rights by growing their medicine or going back to wheelchairs, living with excruciating pain, 
and losing their quality of life without the ability to use cannabis as a medicine. Slide, please. Patients are forced to protest those who should be protecting them and their families, yet they struggle to be heard. Sick people should not have to be fighting their governments as they are fighting their diseases. As a medical patient that's been engaged for over five years politically, it's very disheartening to be thrown in as far as the media perception to appear to be organized crime because I grow to keep myself alive. We try to use the word cannabis as medical patients. We tire of seeing headlines that say, grow ops busted medical license. Yes, there were people that abused their licenses and there were um, organized crime involved, but even according to the RCMP studies of 2010, that number was 70 out of 40,000 patients, yet they threw the others under the bus with their new regulations. Slide, please. And slide, please. No, oh, it went away. Can we go back? No, try ahead. Okay, I'll read what I have here somehow. It's not working. Ah, thank you, yes. The federal government programs continually fall, fail to meet the needs of Canadian patients. On December the 10th, 1997, Patrick Shepard of the Ontario Court of Justice ruled that people must be able to access necessary medical treatment without fear of arrest. Terry Parker became the first Canadian to be exempted from further prosecution for either possession or cultivation of marijuana. Unfortunately, our Harper federal government continues to ignore the rulings of the courts by putting up more and more barriers to dignified access to medical cannabis, then forcing those patients and caregivers who are caught in non-compliance through the criminal justice system. Our provincial governments consistently ignore their responsibility under the Canada Health Act, while our neighbours to the south ignore their federal government's mean-spirited rule of law and stand up for their citizens by implementing programs that allow their weakest and most vulnerable citizens to access this medical plant. We, with it being um, slated as a Schedule One drug, it impedes the provinces from working with it under the Canada Health Act. We're saying we understand that there are federal transfer funds that may be mm, taken away to a degree if a province stands up for the rights of their citizens. But we're also saying look at the financial and economic benefit of doing this. Look at the lives you're saving. Look at the lowering of the health care costs provincially if medical cannabis was to become under their medical, their provincial programs. We being patients um, fighting for our lives, we don't have the expertise and we are not economists. I'm actually reaching out to any of you that can help us put the numbers together to encourage our provinces to step up. Slide please. I began my journey in 2009 while I was on city council. I presented a resolution to decentralize the medical marijuana access regulation program to the provinces. It was not endorsed at that city council, but I gave it to a colleague in Victoria and it was endorsed in Victoria. It was then forwarded to the 2010 UBCM delegates. It was endorsed at UBCM in 2010 and again at FCM, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities in 2011. Across Canada, the municipal elected officials were telling their provincial and federal governments that they want a solution. They want a better system, allow the provinces to administer the programs. The federal government cannot legislatively work with a dignified program. 
It costs taxpayers millions of dollars for the mess that the federal government has created. Provincially, it would cost no money because of the income derived from um, license fees from patients. In 2009, I did a primary research trip to the state of Oregon. They were amazing. I had the opportunity to meet with the head of the state and to see why their program works. And I brought that information back and there was, I formed a small society in Grand Forks where I was on council and our board put together my research in a proposal that we use for the province. But we are not being heard for five years. We are not being heard as patients. In 2012, history was made in British Columbia at the Supreme Court level when Justice Robert Johnson concluded that the restriction of dried cannabis in the medical marijuana access regulations was unconstitutional and it breached section seven of the Charter of Rights. Only in British Columbia can patients use their medicine in the best way that suits their medical needs. It looks like patients in the other provinces of Canada are second class citizens. Do you have family that are sick in Alberta? Ontario? PEI? Why would they not be given the right to heal as we are in British Columbia. Slide, please. No, passed it. It's the one with the little girl. Keep going. Keep going forward. <laughs> no, it's okay. I'm not used to telling someone what to do. <laughs> Keep going. There we are. Thank you. We need to stop the ongoing government abuse of our children. If you have a pen, write this down. Go to YouTube and type in Quest for Kyla to see one of our own babies who lives in Summerland who is suffering. Her grandparents are fighting the broken system for her life while her parents are caring for her. Kyla has a form of epilepsy that cannabis benefits. If Kyla was your granddaughter, what would you be prepared to do to save her life? We are here asking you to think of that question and to come up with some answers, and I'll provide a couple at the end before I close. Uh, slide, please. The Liberal Party in BC made a promise during the election they haven't kept, and that is, to consult with the stakeholders. The doctors have never been consulted with and neither have the patients. Slide, please. The American Epilepsy Society recently made the statement on medical cannabis. Marijuana derivative cannabidiol for some individuals with treatment-resistant epilepsy give reason for hope. It is saving the lives of the children. Slide, please. Up here are the goals of our organization. Doctors should not be forced to be gatekeepers. Naturopaths, nurse practitioners, doctors of Chinese medicine, and chiropractor kinesiologists should be included in the decision making of allowing their patients to access medical cannabis for their purposes. They are trained to work with non-pharmaceuticals. Slide, please. We petition our provincial government to strike a task force to set parameters for provincial medical cannabis program. As it is crucial to ensure the process is not skewed, it is imperative that patients and doctors be included at the decision-making table. Education for all medical practitioners is easy, and they are qualified people who are educating medical practitioners at this time in British Columbia. Slide, please. Growers and dispensaries need to be inspected and regulated. Lab testing needs to be done to ensure quality product and the list of components of the plant and derivatives is there for patients to see. We need to know what's going in our body. Slide please. I'd like to close to honor, by honoring a few British Columbians who have died unnecessarily due to the stigmatism and the ignorance around this plant. Marilyn Holstein at the age 49 from Vancouver she was a double amputee, diabetic, and her doctor had her on 
cannabis for medical purposes. She lived in a senior's home that objected through their ignorance to this plant and they evicted her. She died of a heart attack caused by the stress. I stood up because my dear friend of 20 years who suffered for 10 years of a debilitating disease that the doctors couldn't help her with, I gave her the forms for Health Canada. Her doctor said no, they put her on methadone. I stand here honoring her unnecessary death as she represents millions of others in the same situation. Slides, please. Next one? Next. Oh, no, behind? Uh, one behind? Two behind? Two more? Well, that, wrap, wrap and one more. Yeah, it's a wrap. I don't need to say anything. I think the pictures say it all. Next slide. The same, the picture says it. We are law-abiding citizens. We want our dignity. We want to stop being violated. Next, please. And we are protesting for this right. And finally, next slide. Closest to my heart is the death of Beth Hutchison. She passed in October last year. She is the daughter of one of my colleagues who is here and you could speak with them later, David. Many of you know her sad story. It was highly publicized. She had brain tumors. Her doctors gave her six months to live. They, her doctors applied for Health Canada license. It took six months to get the approval from Health Canada. She was using the Rick Simpson oil, which extended her life two and a half years past the time the doctor said she would die. Next, please. Millions of Canadians are suffering. You may in this room be suffering, but the stigmatism stops you from using this plant, the fear of uh, being found out by friends and neighbors or being arrested. Will you help us? If you will, please come to our booth. We're at number 44. Talk to us. We have a petition. Please sign our petition. My colleagues there are David and Stephen and Johannes. La last slide. Just ask you, what will you do to be part of the solution? Thank you for your time and for listening. So ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Alan Schofer, who is from Maui. And I started to ask around, Maui's a small island, but there are a lot of good people there as to who was the best acupuncturist. And I'm going to let Alan tell his story. He's not only a good acupuncturist, but he's part of our team. And he's going to tell you the story of his, of his business and his life. Thank you, Thank you Harry. Uh, aloha, good morning. My name is Alan Schrofer, and uh, I'm here to tell you why you should know more and care more about alternative medicines. Now, I'm sure some of you are asking, you know, why is this acupuncturist here at this Green Rush conference? Well, I'm in the right room, and so are you, so please stick with me, and I'll make the connection here. My purpose in being here today, is it red or, or green there, Harry? There it is. My purpose in being here today is to open the opportunities of support to the alternative medicine market. Now we can do that by investments into alternative clinics and investments into practitioners who are going to bring this medicine into their community and to yours. We can fund lobbying, research and education and distribution to make clonable business models. Now, I'm uh, honored that Harry chose my slide to use in his own presentation, and you're going to see it again. I want to tell you that in 2009, PricewaterhouseCoopers estimated the U.S. alternative medicine market at $196 billion, with an estimated growth of 7% annually. And as Harry mentioned, by next year, that should be close to $300 billion. Now, where was it 20 years ago? In the U.S., it was $27 billion. I'm no mathematician, but to me, that's about a 1,000% increase in out-of-pocket spending in alternative medicine. Now, that term, complementary and alternative medicine, what is that? 
Well, what it is exactly is anything that is not part of today's, um, considered today's conventional medicine. It's complementary medicine. Now, does that mean it's free? No, of course not. It means it complements anything else you're doing to your health and with your health, whether that's cannabis or going to see your doctor. And it's alternative to anything you're doing with your doctor. So I'm going to condense it all today and just use alternative medicine. In the modern age, more people are developing lifestyle-related diseases and dysfunctions, like diabetes and hypertension and depression, to name a few. And a rapidly increasing number are dealing with greater amounts of stress, which we know is a number one contributor to all diseases and conditions. Many of these people are resorting to commercially produced medications because generally they don't know that there's a natural remedy available, or if they do, they don't know which to use. Alternative medicine needs more public awareness, education, labeling, and marketing to achieve a wider acceptance. It's the very same with the cannabis situation. That said, insurance companies are increasingly offering greater coverage in the alternative medicine market because many companies are recognizing the value to providing this to their employees. Uh, about 20% of Fortune 500 companies are offering alternative medicine to their employees. Don Washkovitz, a CEO of Parker Hannifin, is convinced, and he says, I'm 100% positive we're doing the right thing. He thinks alternative medicine is the solution to America's healthcare problem. And if more companies were to follow this, we'd have a healthier population and be able to spend money on other projects. He has a plant in Michigan, and since 2007, they've seen a 50% reduction in per-employee medical costs, according to a 2012 article in CFO Magazine. Parker Hannifin CEO Don Washkovitz says, it's about choice. If you like what your doctor's doing, then stay with your doctor. Take the medicine he prescribes. But if you want to go with a less invasive, more holistic, and less toxic form of health care and not be party to medications for the rest of your lives, alternative medicine is offering a great place to start. One specific area of growth is the boomer market. Members of the baby boom generation, they don't want to suffer. They'll do whatever they can to preserve good health. We are all just beginning to understand this microbiome, our body, and we're looking for a better alignment into the ways that we live with less side effects and more understanding of our environmental impacts. We're all seeking less of a big hammer approach to medicine and more of an opportunity of holistic care. As ailments become more chronic in nature and diseases like arthritis and heart disease, diabetes, in addition to depression, headaches and anxiety and pain, these are all on the rise. Modern medicine has clearly not been able to address all of these ailments, and a lot of people are looking for other solutions in the form of alternative medicines. Governments all over the world remain divided on how they're going to manage policies within their borders. While many regions in Asia already have in place policies that work with alternative medicines, in many Western countries, particularly in European countries, alternative medicines remain a restricted market. And several herbal remedies, like cannabis, are banned due to lack of sufficient research and testing. It is inevitable, however, that people will seek out the care that best suits them. And more often than you may realize, they're reaching for alternative medicines. Just ask your friends and neighbors. Ask your employees and your family. I bet already some will swear by alternative medicine. The reason people are seeking alternative medicine is because it generally vitalizes and harmonizes the body, keeping you healthier and thereby re reducing your need for some major medical procedures and dependency on pharmaceuticals. The writing is on the wall. The World Health Organization is working in tandem to promote and integrate alternative medicines around the world in healthcare systems. 
They're assisting countries in formulating plans and policies. According to the USA Today, many American consumers cite distrust of big pharmaceutical companies as the number one reason why they're turning to alternatives. And I see some handshaking out there to this. That's beautiful. People want to know what else is out there. Not just instead of their doctor, but what they can do hand in hand with their doctor. Legalizing and distributing medical marijuana. Now that's a very interesting idea to me because, as you know, I'm a practitioner of acupuncture. Chinese medicine has been using the cannabis plant for thousands of years to heal people. Now modern medicine is just getting around to understanding and valuing its uses. As history has shown, science continues to prove the merit of traditional and ancient ways. And we all know that history is destined to keep repeating. Modern medicine, uh, excuse me, it is evident in alternative medicine by its rapidly growing numbers of both practitioners and users. What some consider to be alternative, billions around the world consider to be mainstream. And just as we are seeing this move to utilize the hemp and cannabis crops, we are also realizing that the best way to treat ourselves is in all ways. And alternative medicine is a very relatively untapped resource. Why that's exciting to me is because like many of healthcare professionals, I believe alternative medicine is the left hand to healthcare. For the last few generations, we've been led to believe just do as your doctor says and you'll be just fine. But how many are already turning to alternative medicines? to complement their doctor's care. Well, I'm here to tell you that alternative medicine is already widely accepted in practice, but it's in its early stages of global marketing on the main medical stage. It is becoming what people turn to on a daily basis, just as it was before modern medicine, as it will continue to be around the world, as people use traditional therapies, both complementary and alternative to their doctor's care. Now, I found modern, uh, medic, uh, alternative medicine in 1996 when I had back pain. Three years earlier, I saw a medical doctor, and he told me, well, you have arthritis. One in 10 men your age have it. Here's a pill. I was 22. My first thought was, how can I have arthritis? That's an old man's disease. So I left his office, and I did nothing about it because I truly didn't believe him. Fast forward three years. I land in Maui, I'm on my second day on the island, it's a beautiful place, and I hurt my back. I'm in some of the worst pain of my life and somebody referred me to acupuncture. I had never even heard the word before, and I thought, what is that? And I found something that changed my life forever. Soon after, I graduated massage school and started practicing at luxury resorts, working alongside chiropractors and naturopaths, and continually studying my hands-on healing modalities. I developed a good reputation for deep tissue massage therapy. I mean, look at me, I'm a big guy. People wanted me to bend them into pretzels, and I did. And as that happened, I could actually witness my patients starting to heal, and they also had an awakening to alternative medicine. I knew that I wanted to do more for myself and for those people around me. Now, I believe this is a pretty typical story of somebody in my field of work. Modern medicine failed me in some way, so I went out and got healthy, and I created a life and a career around how I treat myself. And so have millions of people around the world who have been failed in some way by modern medicine. Go see your doctor when it's appropriate. Some of us will go on a daily basis, some of us for labs and checkups. Work with your alternative medicine practitioners to maintain your health your well-being, and for corrective care. Because that's what alternative medicine is. It's your corrective care. It's your, your wellness. It's your maintenance. When used properly, I believe alternative medicine will be a major part of everyone's health care. And Harry's proof to that. When used in tandem with Western medicine, we believe people will live longer, healthier lives. You put premium gasoline in your car, you bring it to the shop when it needs a tune-up, you bring it to another shop 
when it needs major medical repair, or excuse me, when it needs major repair. Now, that's important for a long-lasting car. Isn't it the same with your body and with your health? So what's needed? Alternative medicine needs a bigger voice. It needs more clout in the developed world. And how can that be achieved? How can we bring the benefits of alternative, to every, alternative medicine to everyone's lives? I started with this and I'll say it again. Since about 1997, there has been a nearly 1,000% increase in out-of-pocket spending on alternative medicine. The Institute of Medicine in the UN, United States has stated more than one-third of Americans are using alternative medicine therapies and that visits to modern medical doctors is surpassed now by visits to alternative medicine practitioners. Do you think that's going to change? We believe it's going to change and it's going to keep increasing. I imagine running a successful business where my patients come into an amazing healing environment. They're treated with a conglomerate approach of alternative medical procedures. And while this is happening, we're training more practitioners to go out into the world to bring alternative medicine to those people who need it. To me, this sounds like a win-win for all. So again, why the acupuncture guy at the marijuana conference? because we serve the same demographic. And you should know that there are a lot of untapped sub-industries in alternative medicine, in addition to cannabis and hemp, meaning there are even more reasons to invest. I'm Alan Schrofer. I'll be at the Next Gen booth throughout the day. If you have any questions for me, something I can talk to you about, please feel free to come and see me. Thank you very much for listening. Good. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I just have to get my own act together. Now we have Hugo, Hugo I'm sorry, Kotar from the medical marijuana industry. He's a portfolio manager and licensed user. And where is, there he is. Thank you. Hello, nice big turnout, very excited to be here. Uh, my name is Hugo Kotar. I was a, uh, an investment advisor, worked uh, in the financial service industry for uh, 15 years. And um, I, just... I began investing in my early teens, very passionate about investing. Uh, studied uh, economics at McGill University. Um, I was uh, a senior vice president um, at Canaccord, a member of the Chairman's Club, uh, a group that's reserved for the top 20 advisors. I recently left the industry in order to align myself with a, a small boutique-sized M&A firm that is looking to help uh, finance companies in the space. I have a uh, personal experience uh, with, with respect to medical marijuana. Um, I recently um, underwent a uh, fairly invasive uh, spinal um, surgery. You know, I've got the big gash here. I had to uh, have three discs uh, removed and replaced um, in, my, in my spine. Um, and the entire process was very frustrating, very, very, very painful, debilitating, ongoing pain that was just uh, really uh, almost like being stuck in a purgatory, if you will. Throughout that process, I had access to a plethora of different medical drugs. You know, I went to my doctor some 12, 15 times prior to my getting the operation. Some of the compounds or drugs that um, were made available to me include COX-2 inhibitors, Vioxx, Celebrex, uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory compounds, naproxen, ibuprofen, muscle relaxants, and of course, opiates. Um, I sampled the vast majority of these things um, with very um, limited success. My GP um, suggested that I consider medical marijuana and like many people originally, I mean, my bias was like, geez, medical marijuana, like, I don't really need drugs, I, I just need to get my spine better. Um, and I, I tried the compound, and, and, uh, and to me, it was uh, an eye-opener. You know, I went from 
that skepticism, if you will, to becoming an advocate, you know, like uh, it alleviated my pain to a tremendous extent, um, brought back quality um, of life, um, was, was, was very, very, very effective um, and, and a huge eye opener for me. Um, speaking about the, uh, the, current, the current environment that we have, there was lots of excitement in the space. Um, we're at the dawn of, 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 of a big period of change. Um, the, the, the rush that we're seeing right now, testimony of which is this sort of uh, event that was put on today, is a bit reminiscent uh, from my perspective to the 1998-2000 uh, uh, dot-com rush that we had, um, characterized by rampant, if, 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 if you allow the, the expression, if you will, rampant pandering to investor um, interest. Um, there's, there's lots of confusion as well about the current regulatory environment. Um, obviously, part of this pandering involves people you know, slapping business plans together that are questionable, if you will. Um, we're, we're also witnessing a fair amount of capital being steered towards non-licensed companies, which, um, I'll put it out there, have, have questionable prospects. Um, I think that, you know, investors who are looking to participate in this space have got to build some sort of a, a checklist, if you will, uh, their own due diligence um, checklist as they consider opportunities in the sector. Um, and, and I've devised a checklist myself, and I think, I think one of the keys is understanding the current MMRP uh, regulatory framework. Um, a lot of people haven't, you know, they're jumping in with both feet, um, and I think it's, it's pivotal for anyone considering investment opportunities in the space to make sure that they have a really good handle on the framework. Um, and it's not, um, it's not wizardry, if you will, it's just government regulation. Um, but I think I invite all investors who are keen to participate in this space to familiarize themselves with the framework. Um, I also think that the focus um, on the part of investors ought to be on pre-licensed firm, firms that have received preliminary approval, or um, licensed firms. Now, as we know thus far, there's only 13 firms that have been granted a license, Some, a, a handful of firms that are in the pre-approval process as well. Um, also, I think it's important for investors to pay attention to um, the other aspects of, 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 of the um, investment opportunities that are presented to them, including a well-thought-out financing plan, you know, paying attention to how these companies are going to get financed, um, how the capital is going to be raised. I also think it's very important to focus on uh, isolating solid management teams. Um, I also think it's very important that these companies have experienced growers, because at the end of the day, there's going to be a, a big um, uh, discrepancy, if you will, in the quality of the output and the product. Um, how the company will sell its products as well. As we know under the new regulations, um, the footprint, the retail distribution footprint is, is being banished, you know. I mean, we're no longer um, going to see dispensaries um, being the um, purveyor of these products. Um, users have to go directly to the producers. And here's my uh, contact info. And uh, that's the extent of my presentation, and thank you. I wish everyone a, a good form. Okay, thank you, Hugo. Uh, now we're looking for Chris Perry from Stockhouse. Uh, Chris, if you could come up, please. So uh, many of you, of course, uh, follow Chris on Stockhouse. Uh, he is uh, the man in town here who has his finger on the pulse in the burgeoning medical marijuana industry vis-a-vis -vis the stocks that trade on the venture exchange, the Canadian Stock Exchange, the uh, TSX, etc. So uh, Chris is going to give you uh, his rundown on the industry. So please welcome from Stockhouse, Chris Perry. Thanks very much. Hey, everybody. Thanks for coming out uh, at this early time in the morning for people who may or may not smoke marijuana. Um, so I've been uh, covering this sector for about almost as long as anybody, which would be about three months. And uh, in that time, we've seen a lot of change. A lot of companies come and nearly go. Um, we're likely to see a lot more companies either merge or disappear in the next uh, coming year. So let's go from the start here. This is uh, not the medical marijuana industry, if you believe the news releases that you see out there a lot. It's the exploration of opportunities in agriculture, biotech, finance, health, and mining. And please don't halt trade us while we figure out a change of business. 
So what is agritech mining? Well, in Canada, uh, over the last three months, around 40 Canadian companies have uh, jumped into the medical marijuana game, a lot of them being shell companies previously, or grey market companies, um, that is those who were growing under the old system or even not under the old system. Um, and a lot of mining companies who haven't done a lot of mining lately who have decided that maybe medical marijuana is a good way to continue drawing a CEO salary. <laughs> As a result, about 300 or so brokers around town have been pushing through barbed wire fences, talking to biker clubs and trying to figure out how they can get a deal together that's not going to get their Chinese clients thrown in prison. And I've been uh, quietly chronicling this chaos in the best way I can possibly do so at stockhouse.com. So this is how it all started out for me anyway. Uh, a press release for Satori Resources where they said they were getting into the, well, you can kind of read it yourself. They were getting into every business except mining while still being in mining. What they really wanted to do though, and they'd had this plan I think for about a year previous because they had a ticker symbol of BUD and a name that's based after a Nepalese strain of uh, marijuana, is they were long planning to get into the medical marijuana business, possibly because they have a mine in Flinflon where there used to be marijuana grown uh, in the mine shafts. But this, this announcement started uh, my interest in the business and started them on a bit of a uh, trajectory with their share price, which everybody else came along. Now it's this. Now this is the number of companies three months later who've decided to make the switch. Some of them were already in the business uh, of making that switch beforehand, but a lot of them within a week or so had a business plan. And as you can understand, some of those business plans may not be so well thought out. So most of the weed converts have already won if all you're looking for is a way to move some paper. Um, not that these companies are in any way bad companies. These are actually three companies that I believe have a good business plan uh, and have uh, some management backing that might actually get them through the next 12 months but they've had massive increases in share price based largely around them just being in this sector, but also uh, maybe having a little bit to them. Uh, other companies maybe have jumped up 100%, 200%, 500%, 500%. is why basically we're all here today. If it was just a quiet cottage industry that might make people's backs better, no one would really care that much. But with these sorts of share increases, uh, you're finding even 20 year olds are starting to invest in stocks for the first time. So is this all gonna last? Not really. Um, there will be an industry revolving around medical marijuana in this company, in country, um, and people will be rich, but it won't be guys like this. It will more likely be guys like this. Um, not that I'm in the bag for dev or anything, but uh, you know, guys who are actually CEOs, people who actually have management experience, and who see this less as an opportunity to play gangster, and more as an opportunity to build a potential multinational corporation, are the places where I think you need to, to spend your money. And that's basically what I'm going to talk about today. I've been to a lot of, uh, talked to a lot of people who've been in conferences, like the High Times conference recently, where there's a lot of people talking about how great mar marijuana is, and that's fine. I think we can all agree that there's probably a market for it. Um, but how do you make money? Right now, this market is a bubble. Uh, online, on Twitter, if you do a little digging, you can find massive online buying groups revolving just around weed stocks, 18,000 strong in some instances. Uh, when they decide a stock must be bought, the stock goes up significantly. If you happen to be on part of that train ride, then great. If you're on the other end of it, then uh, you can see your money disappear very quickly. There's a lot of first-time investors. We're noticing at Stockhouse a lot of people who aren't of the traditional high-risk, high-reward investment bracket are starting to get in involved in this thing, mostly because they want to say, I own a weed company, um, not because they necessarily look at long-term fundamentals. So. How can we figure out how to make money off marijuana now? Let's go for a bit of a history lesson to the Prohibition days. As we know, uh, Prohibition from 1920 to 1933, the US outlawed alcohol thinking that that would be the end of crime. In fact, some cities sold their prisons off for development land thinking that with no alcohol there would be no crime to fill them with. That didn't actually work out. A year after uh, Prohibition started, uh, alcohol use was actually up. So who's made money from the end of Prohibition? Not this guy, this is Al Capone. Guys like him may have ran uh, nightclubs and, and places where you could drink, but they didn't make the big money. Big money was made by this guy. Uh, this is Joe Kennedy Sr., otherwise known as the father of President John F. Kennedy. And he made enough money out of the end of Prohibition to make that family basically royalty in the US for the next uh, however long. Um, basically what he did was, seeing the end of Prohibition coming, he went to Europe, signed licensing deals with all of the big brands, Jewers, Whiskey, Gordon's Gin, and filled warehouses full of it. 
So that when prohibition ended, with uh, the general public ex having experienced 13 years of Al Capone rot gut, they were looking to pay a premium price for a premium product. These guys also made a fortune from the end of Prohibition, uh, actually during Prohibition. Uh, what Anheuser-Busch were before Prohibition were one of many farms in the St. Louis area that uh, had a brewery attached to them. When Prohibition came in, those farms disappeared, those breweries disappeared, and what Anheuser-Busch did was they turned their product into a health drink, which they sold in pharmacies. And they turned it into a breakfast product and cooking yeast. And when all of their competitors went out of business, they snapped them up for next to nothing. And then when Prohibition ended, they had supply chain, they had distribution, and they had one of the few brands that was ready to go. So how does this apply to weed? Weed growth is an agricultural sector play. It's not uh, a fast track to riches. Right now, there's already an oversupply of weed in this country and in the US. There's no way, no, no one I know has any trouble getting weed, legally or otherwise. Now, with a legal industry jumping on top of an illegal industry, then you have a situation that's commonly seen as not necessarily a great commodity issue. Um, you have to think that people who've made their living for the last 30 years growing illegal weed aren't going to suddenly sell insurance. They're going to find another way to, to stay in the market, either by legitimizing or by just sticking around and selling it on street corners for cheaper than the legitimate side. But if I'm a Hells Angels biker, and I've been doing this for a while, it's pretty cheap to set up a basement suite with a couple of uh, miles of alfoil and some hydroponic lights, and I can probably get someone to work it for me for free because I'm a thug. Um, but if I'm going to go legal, I need a pharmaceutical grade setup. I need to spend a lot of money on security. I need to have government regulation. I need to figure out local bylaws. I need to pay my taxes. I need to pay specialized people that know how to do this stuff. And then there comes the situation of where do I sell it? Um, I saw recently a press release from Ross Rebagliati, the infamous Canadian weed head from the 80s uh, Olympics. And he said he was, had 12 growers ready to make 1,000 kilograms of weed every, every month and that they were going to sell 12,000 kilograms of weed a month and it was going to be great. Where the hell is he going to sell 12,000 kilograms of weed a month? Like, through what portal? Is he suddenly the Google of weed? Where do you take 12,000 kilograms of weed to? How do you store it? How do you transport it? Who's going to do it? What do you, how do you do a truckload of weed coming from, from Flin Flon to Toronto? Like, this is the stuff that nobody's really thinking about. They're just thinking, quick, get a license, and then we'll print money. The companies that will really do well are the companies that have figured this out, the companies that are, that are looking at vertical integration, the companies that are going to grow it because they can sell it, because they can process it into other products, because they have a market ready to go. And that's very few companies. So in other words, who's going to Starbucks up this industry? Um, for, for mine, weed itself is at the highest point it's going to be for a long time. Weed is going to get cheaper because organized crime uh, is not what we are doing here. There's no reason for a premium price on a product that is suddenly legal. And with companies setting up 800,000 square foot grow ops, there's not going to be any shortage of base supply. In fact, I think there's going to be an oversupply the moment we start throwing things out the gate. Um, you have to also remember that the customer base for this in Canada right now is not recreational, it's disability based. So I don't know any people on disability who, A, are going to be able to negotiate their way around uh, paying a premium price, and B, are going to do anything more than what they've already done, which is likely, if they can, grow it on the premises. Health Canada is looking after this industry, but they're not in any way seeking to shape the industry to make sure everyone's doing okay from it. That's not their mandate. Their mandate is to make sure that the guys who are selling don't have leathers on and the guys who are buying are doing so in a way that's taxable. So, which weed plays have potential? For mine, and do your own due diligence, because if anyone wants to sue me, they'll have a hard time getting anything. I'm a journalist. Vertical integration is key. So companies like Abattis and Creative Edge have figured out that they don't want you want to have one portion of this business. They want to have pieces of many portions of this business. Roll-up plays. Papuan Precious Metals, Dev's company, he said that he wants to go and get 80 uh, uh, dispensaries in the US out of the 800 that are out there and turn them into basically a franchise model to clean up the process so that you know what you're buying, you know what it's going to cost, and you're not being served by someone in a tie-dyed shirt. Um, GW Pharma is uh, engaged in a value-added play in the US where basically they're trying to cure cancer. There's not many industries where you can say we are actually curing cancer. That company's worth billions on the NASDAQ. Um, the difference between them and 
most of the other companies here is they don't go around saying they're a weed company. They don't have a leafy logo. They're a, they're a biomed company. Uh, retail plays, Naturally Splendid is putting together products that they're going to distribute in stores. And you have to think that as long as it's not going to get anyone high, that they're going to be in Whole Foods, they're going to be in, in Safeway at some point. Uh, Bedrocan is a company that is the medical marijuana supplier to Europe, the exclusive medical marijuana supplier to Europe. One must expect that they have a little bit of knowledge and experience that, say, Terra Firma Resources doesn't have. Um, weed support industries is going to be a big deal. Uh, you know, why buy the drill when you can buy the mill? Um, NextGen has got that covered right now. They we're putting on this conference. They've also, they're also setting up a lab facility so that they can get a little piece of every, every gram that's sold by checking for quality control, for making sure that, uh, that companies are doing what they're supposed to do. And then there's branding plays. Uh, the sponsor of the show, Anexco's BC Chronic, is the first real BC weed branding play where they're looking to basically put their stamp of approval on a bunch of products and market the fact that this uh, chronic is coming from BC where there's a reputation for quality. The big thing though in figuring out whether you're going to make money long term on your marijuana investment is legitimacy. And the first step towards legitimacy is to stop calling it a pot stock, to stop saying it's the medical marijuana industry. It's not the medical marijuana industry, it's agriculture, it's tech, it's health, it's retail, it's textiles if you're into hemp. Uh, a, a pizza chain store owner does not say that he's in the dairy business because he moves buckets full of cheese. He's in the food in industry, he's in the restaurant industry, the hospitality industry. If you want to have legitimacy, if you want to be able to be invested in by large Chinese investors, you have to stop associating the company directly with marijuana because that's just not the marketing plan anymore. We, everyone likes to smoke it. Everyone likes to think that we're in an, an illicit business that's going to suddenly take off. But, you know, if you have a portal that allows people to be diagnosed uh, by a doctor on Skype, that's a tech play. It may be marijuana related, but it's a tech play. And those legitimate sectors that are established are a lot easier for institutions to invest in than, hey, we're just uh, we're starting up a push for medical cocaine, you know. Um, <laughs> And we have to stop it with the leafy green logos because really, uh, as an investor, I don't want to have that in my portfolio. I want to have a, a good, strong company that's making money in a sector that's on the rise. And I don't care if it's marijuana. I'm not into it because it's marijuana. I don't smoke. I smoked once in my life and I spent four hours staring at the hairs on my elbow. It's not a selling point for me. The other thing is the license situation is going to cause a real problem soon. Every company that's out there thinks it's going to get an MPR, MMPR license. Every company that's not here thinks it's going to get one. Uh, and if they do, it's going to be all hell to pay. Every corner of the market will be flooded with $1 a gram weed. Most companies are not going to get a license, even if they tell you they're on their way, even if they tell you they're going to, they're going to do everything they need to do. If they do all get licenses, we're done for. And if they don't, most companies are going to crash. Uh, of the 12 licensed companies so far, only one is public, only one is coming public, and the others are thinking about it. Uh, and even if you get a license, are you going to get zoning permission? You know, I, I don't know about you, but you may get an option on a license in Abbotsford for, for a grower, but try dealing with Abbotsford City Council on any marijuana-related subject. You are not going to get permission to change zoning so that you can start growing weed. So what makes more sense for me uh, using a license or if you get one selling it to the highest bidder. I think that's what's going to end up happening is, is that the licenses that do go out are going to be seen as licenses to print money and those companies that don't get them are going to have to raise a lot of money to try and get into that game. So in summation this is a transformational industry and to be honest I've written this uh, speech nine times in the last three weeks because every time I think I've got it locked down the industry changes overnight um, and that's going to keep happening. If you're looking for a long bet you got to do what you do with mining, do what you do with tech. You stick to the fundamentals. You find people who've got a track record and know what they're doing and aren't going to take your money out to the back 40 and just burn it. Uh, is management experienced? Are they just me tooing it or have they got a defined plan? Have they been around for a while? Is your stock being day traded by people? Is that why it's going up or is it legitimately going up because people who are smart investors think that it's a good play? So we're barely getting started. Um, I'm going to be updating this stuff every day at Stockhouse. And uh, if you need to get word out to investors, plug, 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 go see the Stockhouse booth because that's what we do. Thank you very much. Do you want to get on this panel today at 420? Yeah, yeah all right.
Just ask this gentleman onto the panel. He's got a lot of good points, but there's going to be a bit of a debate this afternoon. Okay, now we have Mr. Dr. Paul Hornby. Dr. Paul here somewhere? There he is. I met Dr. Paul Hornby about five or six weeks ago and spent a very enjoyable evening with him. He spent his life in this industry and he knows what he's talking about. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Paul Hornby. Yeah, right now? Yes. Oh, Hello. Uh, good morning. The mic on? Yeah. Good morning. Uh, this is really exciting for myself. Um, I can't believe it's happening. I'd, I had never predicted the stock market interest in, in medical cannabis. I had, <laughs> I thought it would go to friends and family and uh, now here it is going to the public. Uh, we're allowed licensing to research cannabis now. That's another exciting thing that's exciting to myself because for years I've done it with uh, under quasi-legal umbrellas called dispensaries here in Vancouver. I had my lab in a dispensary for five years. Can I get a slide? Oh, sorry. Uh, that's forward. Okay. You know what we could do? It was supposed to be a break right now, right? You have your slides on a stick? Yeah. Okay. Here's what we're going to do, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to take about a 10-minute break. We're going to load up Dr. Paul's slides. That's probably my fault. And we were supposed to have that break anyways because these gentlemen have to go to the potty and so do I. Okay. So come back in 10 minutes, please. This is a very good speaker. Okay. He's going to get them for you.